Okay, welcome everyone to the televideo talk. Everyone, I'm sure, knows what a televideo machine is. Maybe, maybe not. Okay. I'm Patrick Finnegan. I, am, I work at Purdue University. I am the data center architect there. Um, as it happens, I had a little bit of free time last year, um, found a new project to work on. A lot of people have worked on small, building small machines. I decided to build a machine that had over 100 ICs on it based off just a blank PCB. Um, Televideo produced this machine shown on the picture. Um, it was a TS-800A. It was their first diskless network booted um, Z80 based CPM machine. Um, they actually started out making terminals. Almost everyone has heard of televideo terminals. If you watch the movie War Games and a bunch of other ones, um, they were pretty popular in a bunch of those movies. They look like VT100s, but strange. Um, a, little, a few years later, they actually hired a designer and stopped copying everyone else's design, probably after getting threatened with lawsuits. But, you know. Um, so in the early 80s, they made uh, f they started with a few different CPM machines. They came out in 1981, best time to come out with CPM machines. There's no other machines of significance coming out in 1981 that might change the overall architecture of computers. Um, so they came, I uh, found a byte ad from 1982. They show, ooh, I, got a, I got a pointer there. This little thing, which is a desktop machine, they made one that was just a couple floppy drives, they made one with a floppy and a hard drive. Um, they're basically a file server, um, and you could hook up a couple of clients, like the TS-800A, to them. But the TS-800A is not what we're here to talk about, it's the TS-80, which is the lost machine. The machine that was so buggy that it was only on the market for a few months. Um, so yeah. Their, their idea was network the world with CPM and 800 kilobit SDLC links. Technology we still have today. Or maybe not. Um, so, after years and years of not finding anything, finding the original TS-80, I found a blank PCB on eBay for sale. No idea how. Some engineer that worked for Televideo, I'm sure. Like, oh, perfect, this is great. It's got chips labeled with part numbers. I'll just go to BitSavers and find the schematic. So I found the technical manual on BitSavers. Thanks, Al. Um, and there was this level of detail, which is kind of fun. Uh, the next diagram I found was this level of detail, which was also kind of fun. And I'm like, well, maybe this isn't quite as easy as I thought. But I have a scanner that can scan 11 by 17 prints. Um, the PCB mostly fit in that size. Trying to align scans was terrible, so I used a digital photograph in the end. But lined up the scans, tried to scan, tried to trace the traces. Thousands of traces later, I got a few of them wrong. That didn't make any sense. Went back with a multimeter. I don't know. This was a few weeks worth of work. But from there, I could figure out what didn't make sense from the TS-800A, which was a bug-fixed and somewhat upgraded version. Um, there's actually schematics. There's about, I think, 15 pages of schematics for the machine. Um, so these were based off of Televideo's terminal systems, the 950 to be specific, which was sort of their first terminal in this form factor, the more expensive version. Everyone's familiar with the 925, which was the cheap one that came out a couple years later. So it had a 6502 processor in it, a little bit of memory, some ROM, um, character generation logic. Then they just bolted on to that Z80 based machine with DMA and SIO and sort of made two machines in one, PCB, ran it off a 30 watt crappy linear power supply and called it good. Um, later they switched to switching power supplies that actually didn't cook themselves, but at the end of this process, I ended up with page one of schematics. This would be 
This would be the terminal logic. Uh, page two of schematics would be the Z80 machine. I can tell the difference because this one looks nicer than this one. The terminal was, I don't know, I still haven't quite figured out how all of the video generation works, but it takes data out of memory, shoves it through some ROMs and a bunch of random logic and comes out with composite video on that, so that's a lot of fun. Uh, the Z80 machine was pretty bog standard. You could probably copy it out of an application note in a Zilog data book. Um, four megahertz. The interesting thing was the network. The network was, it was all four megahertz, so Z80A, um, second generation Z80 stuff. They pushed the SIO chip as fast as it could go, which was 800 kilobaud, which is five times divider for uh, the system clock. There was, it was all sorts of fun trying to figure out all of the timing loops and trying to find, finding all the race conditions. You literally had to have specific instruction, specific instruction in specific order in order to push data out at the right rate to not under or overflow buffers. From there, I ended up with the PCB. PCB has all the ICs. The initial PCB, I had all the original ICs in exactly the same places. Um, Rev2, I replaced some of the hard to find EPROMs, which were 2532s with 2732s, which are easy to find. Um, pretty much all the parts are still findable. The hardest part to find is the 6545 CRT controller. They're just a little expensive. Um, the, you can't buy tubes of them on eBay for cheap. So from there, I had a PCB made in China. This was about $80 per PCB times minimum quantity of five. So it's not a cheap project. Um, all the ICs added another $250 or so to the price of the machine. So you're looking at $350 plus uh, a few months worth of my time. Um, thanks to spending a few months at home unexpectedly last year, I actually had time to work on this. Uh, so the first thing I did is build up the Z80 part. Um, the biggest problem I had with this is they derive the serial clock off the 6502 side. I had to so I had to feed a serial clock into the Z80. So I got to learn a little more about how RS-232 works if it's not just data lines, but you have a clock too. From there, I was able to write my own BIOS because blank board, no software. Um, I was lucky to be able to copy the terminal parts of the Televideo 950 terminal because that was, they were lazy and copied off existing design, but the, actual post and boot ROM. As I tell the video stuff at this time, the level of verbosity was it printed out a dot when it tried booting. If it failed booting, it printed out another dot when it tried again. Um, I made it a little more verbose, did, did some RAM checks, actually printed out status of stuff so I could debug when I had screwed up address lines and shorted out some traces and all that fun. And at this point, I got to actually boot. Um, so it booted, but it was not happy. So at that point, I got to do some debugging of the actual OS it loaded and figured out the dip switches on the back, get read at boot time, and tell it what kind of machine it is. So the dip switches that were set wrong told it, oh, you want to do DMA in this direction instead of that direction. Figuring that out, finally booted up CPM, got a directory listing. This was, this was amazing. Um, so you can see I have the back end of a Televideo 950 open there with the, my, the board I was working on uh, stuck on the table and my tight, cramped workspace. It is cramped because it is a small steel case desk with a bunch of projects at the same time, usually. Um, 
I don't know. I don't know if anyone else is familiar with working on multiple projects at the same time, but cramp workspaces. Yeah, no one? Okay. Um, from there, I found all of the bugs. So there were bugs in the original PCB because it was a prototype that they probably cut the traces on the manufacturing floor and ran some bodge wires. They were I know this is surprising, but there were a few bugs that I introduced in the design too. Um, all of the debugging took a couple weeks to sort out, just because it's, I'm like, I don't understand how any of this works. There's 100 chips. There's two different computers on one board. Yeah. Uh, got a fancy new PCB, spent another $350 from China. Um, started getting it soldered again. So I got all this put back together about the time I had to go back to work. Um, got the boards in. So i like, Jim, I should give a talk and tell a video. You have a slot open, why not? Um, that was about two weeks ago. And just after, I'm like, I should finish building that project that I'm going to give a talk on. So soldering the project. And finally got one together that doesn't have ugly little adapter PCBs, doesn't have bodge wires. It actually worked the first time once I remembered the dip switches settings were critical. You learn, you end up learning lessons twice when you spend a year not doing a project in the middle of the project. Um, actually got it running. The next project after that was like, well, I've got this machine with all these hard to find parts. That's a gigantic PCB. I'm sure everyone's going to run out and buy televideo machines that they've never heard of, spend hundreds of dollars on them, because everyone in this hobby has limited, unlimited amounts of money. Um, but maybe a smaller machine would be good. So I started thinking about this. I'm like, we probably don't need a terminal built into it. Why don't we just have a serial port? Just take the Z80 part, the multi-user part, Parts that are sort of interesting. Update a little bit with some surface mount components. I know not everyone loves surface mount components, but it makes the board five bucks instead of 80 bucks, so that's, that's something. Threw that together. Came up with the board design. So the board's about four inches square. It was small enough to get it under the um, $5 for 10 boards at Seed Studio. So $80 to basically 50 cents. <laughs> and it's about that size. That's my next project. I started soldering one, and then my cheap Chinese hot air workstation died. So yeah, that didn't get finished just because I started working on it about last weekend. Um, So in the end, I've got a GitHub project, github.com slash vax11. I want to give a thank you to Al Kosau. BitSavers was a huge help to developing all this. Um, and I'm sure all of you have many questions, so I decided I'd leave about 45 minutes in this talk for questions. <laughs> Um, so a few things that I've done, I built, so originally they had a few different kinds of file server that were just a file server and a print server running a Z80. Um, I've re-implemented that with a uh, Raspberry Pi clone called the Next Thing Chip. Um, they had a concept of special files that would let you read and write data that was generated by the host. So I've actually uh, usurped that in order to be able to download things from the internet. So I can actually look at the VCF website, for instance, from, well, I can look at a, a copy that went through links. It's not very, it's not graphical. <laughs> um, but in the future, that could be interactive, too. It wouldn't be that hard. Um, it's, it's just a small software program. 
pro problem, not a uh, hardware problem. I have never done anything like this before. Um, I, so I, I got an ECE degree from Purdue. So I did a small amount of board design for senior design. And it, before I did this project, it had been pretty much 15 years since I've actually touched any of these tools. It, I did a few small projects. I did a little keyboard converter thing. Um, it was, there's a lot I can still do and learn about the televideo stuff. I think software is going to be sort of the next thing I go into. I don't know if anyone has good suggestions for something that's lost. Um, televideo is sort of, this stuff is sort of nice because there's not any programmable logics. There's not really ASICs. Uh, my hardest problem about generating programmable logic was generating a boot ROM, which wasn't, I, I had some code, I knew what bootstrapper code that I had to load in. I had other machines I could disassemble the boot ROM. So I could sort of go through that. Um, I don't know, if you, ha if you have suggestions. Um, I think the biggest takeaway from this is it's a lot of work, but it's really obtainable, um, this sort of machine. It's not the fancy GUIs that everyone is sort of going after these days, but I don't know, even those, given more effort, you can do it. I was surprised how far I could get without even schematics. It's, it's just pin out, start pinning out traces. <laughs> I couldn't quite make that out. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so the biggest thing is they actually, more of the machines from this time period only had one computer built in. This had all, so the terminals they had were actually a full 6502 based computer with RAM and ROM and peripherals. And they had a Z80 with more RAM and ROM and peripherals sort of tied together. Um, it seemed like a lot of it was they, they were trying to get fast to market. And in doing that, they were, instead of designing anything custom, they were just gluing together existing parts. Um, so they ended up with something that started out sort of expensive. So the disk full version was about $3,500. And the next rev, they had sort of integrated things, taken out the 6502 part, reduced the chip count. Um, and that was, they had dropped like $1,000 off the price of the machine. Um, these are all designed, these are all aimed at sort of business systems. So they're sort of popular with small legal and medical practices just for records keeping and billing and all the other CPM stuff like that, but you, these actually could share, the central file server sort of could work like a database server, it had some record locking, so you could actually have multiple users working on a database at once, which is a little different than what most CPM machines could do. Um, this, the speed gain was mostly from, the program was running on individual users terminal, the user station, instead of running on the central one big server that had only four megahertz worth of Z80 to share between 16 users. That was really just doing the file serving. Um, I don't know, does that sort of answer your question? If you want more information on Televideo, I did a talk two years ago at VCF that I'm sure you can find on YouTube and the website. Sure. Um, it is. Com what is it compatible with? 
It is 800 kilobaud SDLC. Um, if you've used, you have no idea what that is. Um, HDLC, which is the successor to SDLC, was a popular networking um, line protocol. So if you had a T1 line, um, the serial interface that between your router and the T1 uh, modem would be talking SDLC or HDLC. Um, IBM used it a lot. So why would they use this? It was a feature built into the Z80S IO. It let them communicate at 800 kilobaud um, over relatively long lines, I think 300 feet or so, maybe a little bit longer, um, over a shielded cable. Um, on top of it, the protocol looked a lot like if you serialized CPM um, system calls. So it would be sort of like the machine would send, OK, I want to read this block off the disk. The server would be OK, and then it would send the data um, and in the reverse. So it, it does remote procedure calls that look like CPM syscalls. Yeah, so it's really low level. It's not like TCP or anything. There's not nearly enough. It doesn't really take a lot of buffering. Um, the most buffering it has to do is one CPM record, which is 128 bytes, really. Which is how you could make this work on a 64K machine pretty effectively. Multi-pack? Multi-M. CPM, multi-M, it was NPM, right? Yeah. I was on a thing called multi -M. Okay. And this thing is like, dead and done the same thing. All yeah. the way down to the, you know, SIO serials, it's multi-pack, and it's multi-pack, and it's multi-drop, presumably, 422. It's not multi-drop. Oh, well, they didn't go that route. Right. The server has individual ports for each client. Uh, Only one can talk at a time, just because yeah. of the OS. No, so they actually had individual serial links, individual serial controller chips on the server to talk to each client. Um, so the client would raise the request line, RTS line, to the server and then wait for, it, for its response to be requested. And it sort of just did a round robin of each device. Yeah. Yeah. So it did all the same stuff you were talking about. Encapsulate the, the CPM call sent over to the server. Yep. The server it was also a CPM. It did uh, it had one like big disk yep. for everybody and then, and then a file for each client. And the server machine had a separate Z80 for every terminal, so it ran R32 back to the screen. So that I guess yeah. where this differs. Yeah, so this Yeah, so this Yeah, so this put the Z80 for each client in the terminal for the client. So it's a little more distributed, but yeah, similar idea just differently implemented. Um, so these ran a televideo system called Most MMMOST, which I forget the acronym, multi-user multi-programming operating system technology, something like that. Um, Turbo DOS was a popular replacement for that. It's a lot easier to find machines that ran Turbo DOS. Um, I think it was a lot faster for, they, they actually put time into uh, optimizing it. Um, there were a other, couple other uh, replacements that worked with this. Turbo DOS worked with other machines too in different configurations. But. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.